Thanks everyone for coming to the ISL Colloquium today. We're uh, super happy to have Laura Waller here from UC Berkeley, and she'll be telling us about end-to-end -end learning for computational microscopy. Um, so please take it away. Thanks. Um, so uh, I'm trying to keep this for a fairly general audience, um, and, but please feel to interrupt, free to interrupt if you have any questions. Um, I wanna give like, it's kind of like a high level overview of a lot of projects that are going on in my group, but all centered around one sub project, which we call Diffuser Cam, which I'll explain. Um, but I want to use it to help explain some of the trends in computational microscopy, particularly this end to end uh, learning or design. So to think of computational imaging as this idea, it's like a design concept or like a way of thinking. Um, for designing imaging systems. So you have your hardware toolbox, which is optics and the physics of how light propagates through your optical system. And that's what sort of the domain of optical engineering. And then we also have this computation toolbox where we can capture images and then do like fairly complex algorithms or computations on them to reconstruct different quantities or to, to change the images. And so this hardware and software um, should be co-designed in a computational imaging system, meaning that you use the best of sort of put together in creative ways to try to get the best of both worlds. Um, so you need people working on this who know both the physics and the computation. Um, and really the heart of computational imaging are these back and forth arrows that um, your hardware design and your software design should all in, should inform each other. And you typically go back and forth iteratively, um, figuring out what's best to do in software versus hardware, et cetera. So the most recent trends in computational imaging are around what I'm gonna call data-driven design. And this is all spurred on by machine learning being uh, sort of like really powerful these days and uh, able to solve really gigantic nonlinear, non-convex problems like, um, like design problems in optical engineering. And so um, data-driven design is all about uh, optimizing your imaging system in terms of hardware and software. So you're not, just, uh, you're not just using like signal processing techniques to figure out the best uh, algorithm to solve for your image reconstruction, but you're also trying to optimize the hardware itself and, and how to design that hardware, which has always been something that was left to the black magic of optical engineering um, and the expertise that, that the designers have. So let me give you a, a concrete example. This is the canonical lensless imaging problem. So I take a camera and I just remove the lens and point the sensor at the world and take a picture. And that picture of course looked like garbage because there was no lens there to form the image. But I argue that the lens's only job was to bend those light rays in order to form the image. So if I could computationally bend those light rays, I could theoretically computationally reconstruct the image from this measurement because it's the same light that hit the sensor uh, if the lens was there versus if the lens was not there. In practice, this is far too well closed. It's not going to work. So diffuser cam is something where we, we put something in the way of the, opti of the light um, it's this diffuser. So a diffuser is just a bumpy piece of plastic. Uh, so sometimes you're gonna see we do like do this with scotch tape or with like those uh, stickers that you put on your windows so your neighbors cannot see in. So a diffuser is a scattering element and we place it really close to the sensor within a few millimeters. In fact, we just stick it onto the cover glass on top of the sensor. And so I argue that this optical element isn't a lens of course, but it, like a lens, it's bending the light rays. It's just bending them in an unknown random way. But we're gonna be able to deal with that in software. So from this, uh, so the image that I take is still an image that looks like garbage, but this image is structured garbage and from it, I can actually reconstruct the result. So this is kind of like the first step in the basis of a lot of projects that I'm gonna talk about in this talk. Um, so this is a very different kind of camera, right? A normal camera has a lens and maps a point source in the scene to a point on the sensor. So if you talk about um, a point in the scene, what is the image it creates? Well, ideally it creates a point if you have a perfect lens because of diffraction, it actually creates this like Bessel function like thing. Um, but 
the response of the system, so the intensity that I measure at the sensor given a point in the scene is called the point spread function. It's basically just the impulse function of the system. Um, so there have been lenses cameras before us uh, and uh, most of them use amplitude masks. So they put like a pattern mask, like one of these weird patterns uh, or like uh, different types of redundant arrays. Um, and so their point spread function will be these weird patterns that they've designed. The diffuser right, cam is like that. You have a question? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, sorry. Um, I've heard this argument before that you can reconstruct the image, but could you make the case that I've, I've also heard in the context of computational imaging that is, what is the benefit of using, say, the diffuser versus a lens? Is there, um, is it just demonstrated that it can be done or does it have a benefit? Yeah. Can you achieve a better signal to noise ratio? I understand there may be a more compact system or, you know, but, but I don't understand what is the, the final benefit of pursuing that approach? Um, I'm going to talk about this a lot. So let me like push a little bit of that off. So for now, you can say this is much more compact than a lens system. A lens would have to be way out here. The lens would be much heavier. So if you care about the compactness and the weight, then this could help you. I'm going to get to why that's not a great argument later. Um, but for now, so far, this is cheap because the diffusers are cheap and it's compact. Um, but I'll explain later why that's not super useful. Okay, so um, for now, let's just uh, explain how it works. So you've got this diffuser and you capture an image with a point source and it looks like this. It looks like this weird caustic pattern, like the bottom of swimming pool on a hot day. And that's exactly what it is, random focusing essentially. And uh, as long as you know this point spread function, it's okay that it's weird. Um, we had some awesome undergrads, Camille and Trias, who spent their summer building this with scotch tape and a Raspberry Pi sensor, so it would be extremely cheap, and then uh, wrote up some open source code and instructions for it if you want to build one at home. Um, I don't think you're going to build it at home to have a better camera, but it's a fun project. Some people have done it and sent us pictures. It's really fun. Uh, and if you try it, please do send me your results if you get anything good. Um, OK, so if I have a point, it creates this caustic pattern. If I move that point laterally, the the point spread function simply shifts. If I turn on two points at once, I get the linear sum of the intensity from each. So this is a linear system in terms of intensity. So I can write this as like matrix vector multiplication here. Um, so my scene is this vector X, my measurement is the vector Y, and in a traditional camera, your A matrix or forward model here, uh, you're aiming for it to be the identity matrix. So optical designers have spent centuries trying to make the, their forward models identity matrix. Whereas with computational imaging, you throw away that goal and you instead are aiming for a forward model A matrix that is known and invertible. Um, so uh, maybe for now, let's just forget about the invertible part, but knowing it is not straightforward. So I could measure it, um, like I could go in my scene and put my iPhone flash at the point source and move it to every position within the scene and take a measurement. Basically each measurement would be a column of this forward model or A matrix. Uh, that would be extremely time consuming and it's expensive if you have to move your point source precisely across the entire scene. Um, and if we're talking about a one megapixel camera, which is a pretty low resolution camera, then you're taking a million calibration images and then you end up with this A matrix that's a million squared that you need to invert. And that's just not practical. We want you to be able to build this at home and do it on your laptop. So that's not a good strategy. Um, we could model it. So we could go and have you measure the surface shape of that diffuser, but we want you to make it at home with scotch tape. And so you're not gonna be able, you're not gonna have an AFM at home to measure that surface shape. We could machine learn it, so just forget about this forward model and let a big neural network do everything. I'll talk more about that later. But um, the best strategy in practice that we came out is hybrid of all these three. So here's the, the measure and model part. Um, basically, if I take a point source and I sh shift it, sorry, shift it around laterally in the scene, the caustic pattern just shifts. So this uh, shift property means that the system is shift invariant because the system response shifts 
with the, the position of the point in the C. So that means this A matrix is actually a convolution matrix. And that's only true if you design this correctly. So our diffusers are actually relatively weak diffusers. They have fairly large bumps, large, relatively smooth bumps. That's why these caustic patterns are, are relatively smooth. Um, and, and that makes everything praxial optics, which is why it's convolution. It's a convolution. So if the A matrix is a convolution, you're golden, right? You just take a single point spread function, which is a single column measurement of A by putting your, your iPhone flashlight out in your scene and taking a a measurement and that's your calibration because now the rest of the a matrix is just the same thing with shifted columns and then furthermore since it's a convolution you don't need to instantiate the a matrix at all because it's gigantic and you can just do a deconvolution in in fft space um, which is extremely quick so we do all of this uh on a basic laptop uh running on a gpu with like uh, real-time reconstructions for the 2d case so here's some some raw captured data, the reconstructed image, much prettier image. Um, okay, and so then I just want to talk a little bit about how we solve the inverse problem. Um, I said it's a deconvolution. There's some caveats to that. Um, one of the caveats is that that point spread function flies off the edge of the sensor. So there's a cropping function that comes into play as well. Um, you can just trust that we deal with that. But basically we set it up as a big optimization problem. We're trying to minimize the difference between the measured image that we captured and the expected measurement given our current estimate passed through the forward model. And then we do some, some update of our estimate at every iteration. Uh, we add a constraint that there's only positive intensity because uh, physically you can't have negative intensity, you can't have negative light. So that's just a nice extra constraint. And then here we have this extra term here that is enforcing some sort of regularizer. And we can tune it with lambda, um, but you can pick some sparsity basis. So a lot of the results I'm showing you, we use total variation or TV sparsity um, as a, a prior to, to a, a regularizer basically. And for the 2D case, it's not an underdetermined problem. And so it's just doing noise cleanup. So it's not really big effect in, in the initial images. I'm gonna show you it's tuned down pretty low. Um, we saw this with ADMM. Uh, from Stanford, so probably people know about it there. And it's all in Halide. Um, my colleague, Jonathan Reagan Kelly, wrote this so that you can use your GPU hardware very efficiently without being an expert GPU programmer. Okay, so I call this like the physics-based or model-based uh, image reconstruction solver. So you put in your input measurement, you run it through this iterative optimization program and it spits out your final result. The other way you could do this is with neural networks. So I could give it a whole bunch of input output pairs that maybe I synthetically generate. And then I could use that to train a, a deep neural network that would hopefully then learn how to predict the output from the input. Um, so basically you're throwing away all of the physics that you know, this physical model or forward model A matrix, and you're letting the neural network figure it out on its own. So uh, you need a lot of training data for that, but uh, there's going to be pros and cons. So I like to think Laura, of this a lot. Can I ask you a quick question? Sorry. Yeah. Hi, Laura. Brian Wandell here. Um, I, I, could you say something about depth, uh, about depth of field and if points are close or versus far? Yeah, you guys are getting ahead of me. So I'm going to talk about how you do the 3D version of all of this next. But um, for now, this is a 2D imager. And we've designed the camera so that its hyperfocal distance is two meters. So we're doing photography here. So as long as you're further than two meters away, there is no depth discrimination capability. And so it's really just, it's always in focus after two, two meters. Um, okay, so back to this like physics-based versus deep learning based. Um, and there's a lot of people being sort of moving to the deep learning side of things. Um, this is the more classical or traditional way using FISTA or gradient descent, ADMM, et cetera. And they, they have pros and cons, right? So oh, I argue that the physics-based way, because you're putting in this known forward model, which represents the physics of your optical system, it's pretty interpretable. Um, but if you get that forward model slightly wrong, you can have model mismatch problems. Um, deep learning can be a really fast reconstruction after you do some really painful training uh, operations. Um, and it's not super interpretable, but it can also fix some of these model mismatch artifacts. So what we wanted to do was pull the best of both worlds and use the physics we know, and then learn 
lots of other things or the things that we don't know so that we can get the, the sort of like the highest quality image without throwing away inform known information like this a, a matrix or Ford model. So uh, the benefits of doing this sort of hybrid way are that you can get really efficient parameterization. So we're gonna get away with a lot of, uh, a lot less training data, which is really important in cases like this because it's not so easy to collect big training data sets. And they're probably going to practically be on a per camera basis. So you'd have to do it like for each case. Um, and I just hate the idea of throwing away known physics. Um, okay, so the way that we actually implement that is uh, with these unrolled neural networks. So an, the unrolled neural network here means that I have a neural network which has a bunch of layers and each layer is, represents uh, all of the operations that go into one iteration of this ADMM solver. It doesn't have to be ADMM, you could do this with Vista. And so you make like each iteration of your algorithm becomes a layer of the network and you have some loss function. Um, so we're just gonna use some perceptual loss functions here. Uh, we tried a bunch of them. We don't have a good reason for using one versus the other. We just picked the one that we like best. And uh, basically then you have this neural network where essentially the architecture of the network is defined by the physics of the system because the physics of the system sets the operations within each of these iterations. And then we can learn whatever we want. So we're gonna learn all the hyperparameters of the ADMM algorithm. And then sometimes we just throw a unit at the end to clean things up, um, or you can add in other things that you don't know. So if you, if you have some parameterized um, knowledge that your forward model or A matrix is imperfect, like with misalignments, et cetera, you can, you can learn those parameters as well. Um, so here's some result. Um, ground truth image, and then the physics-based way. So this is ADMM, uh, pure ADMM. So the iterative model-based optimization. And it's slow and has artifacts. If we do a pure deep learning approach with lots and lots of training data, I think 25,000 training data pairs, then we can get a fast reconstruction with different artifacts. And then if we do this hybrid approach where we do the sort of both at once, we get reasonably fast. This is sufficient for real time performance. And this is the highest quality image according to our perceptual metric. Um, any questions? Okay, so now to 3D. Um, so great question about what happens at different depths. Well, uh, if you go far enough away, nothing is happening. Um, but now let's bring our object closer to the sensor and see what happens. So now as I take my point source and shift it axially, I get a caustic pattern as my system response function. But now that you see the caustic pattern is basically scaling with depth of this point source. So the point spread function is a function of depth. That means we have depth information. Um, and it's basically a scaling function, so we can predict the point spread functions at other depths from a given, a given calibration measurement. So we can have a different response of the system for every 3D position, um, sort of in this volume near the sensor, and we can, know, we can calibrate it with just a single calibration measurement. Just put your iPhone flashlight on and take a picture. Okay, so I want to argue here uh, why we went to 3D. And it was basically like, if you think about the 2D case, as someone mentioned in their question, like what's the point? Um, so I just like, you saw our images, they have artifacts. We could work on cleaning them up. Almost certainly those artifacts are model mismatch because after we took the calibration measurement that like that diffuser warped or heated up or like slightly shifted. And so our calibration was slightly wrong. So we could work on all of this, making it all better, making it more like a commercial system. And then we would have a camera that's really compact and cheap. But if you look at like cell phone cameras these days, they're already extremely compact and extremely cheap. They're all ready made out of plastic uh, lenses. And so you're not gonna get a lot of benefits on that. And it just didn't seem like a fruitful research direction for us. But this 3D stuff is really interesting because um, 3D is something that regular cameras just don't do. So think about a regular camera, when you have something in focus, it's sharp. And when it's out of focus, it's blurred. Um, and when the image is, when the stuff out of focus is blurred, that information is gone. And there's no inverse problem that can bring it back uh, without guessing. If you think about this kind of lenses camera like this, well, what's happening at different depths? 
I'm just getting a different point spread function. But all of these point spread functions notably have sharp spatial frequency information in them, meaning that I can potentially reconstruct a sharp image at all of these depths. Um, so there's not this blurring effect with defocus. In fact, there is no such thing as defocus with a lensless camera because there is no focus plane. That is just different responses at different depths. Okay, so we have to think about how to solve this problem. And we want to stick to, we're doing, we're going to try to reconstruct 3D. So now this X vector is say like it's a one megapixel sensor, then it's a million. We want to reconstruct the full lateral resolution across say a hundred depths. So this X vector is now a hundred times longer than it was before. Um, but we're still going to take only a single measurement say with this one megapixel camera. So that makes this A matrix uh, 100 million by a million. And basically the A matrix is made up of these blocks. Each of these blocks is a convolution matrix. Um, and then each one is a convolution with one of these point spread functions that's been scaled appropriately for the depth. So again, we don't actually ever instantiate this thing, but we use the fact that it's a convolution to, uh, to make the computation sort of feasible in a regular computer. So now we're left with this one glaring problem that this is a severely underdetermined system. In fact, if I want 100 depths, then it's underdetermined by a factor of 100. Uh, so how are we going to solve that? Well, we're going to go towards compressed sensing. So uh, we're going to say um, we can solve this underdetermined problem if we make an assumption that the scene is sparse in some basis set. And uh, I'm going to show you later, we're going to get into microscopy, in, in which case, like fluorescence microscopy, things tend to be very sparse in 3D space because you're, you're only tagging or like uh, you only have certain parts of the sample light up. But in, in regular 3D imaging, uh, things tend to be more sparse, or they might be sparse in some other basis set, like total variation or wavelet, et cetera. Um, so I just want to give a quick example. This is a really a toy example. So if I take my regular image and I reconstruct it, um, I could go and just delete 80% of the pixels in the original image, and I still get a decent reconstruction. So this is just showing you that this system is amenable to compressed sensing. I can actually delete 90%. Even if I delete 98% of the data, I can still get sort of an image, which wouldn't be true with a regular camera. And this all stems from the fact that our measurements are multiplexed, that a point in the scene maps to this caustic pattern, which is covered by many pixels on the sensor, right? So if a point in the scene maps to lots of pixels on the sensor, then when I delete some of the pixels on the sensor, I still have information about that point in the scene. That's very different than a regular camera, right? If, if a point maps to a point and you delete the pixel associated with that point, that information is lost. So now it's just mixed in with all of the other pixels information. And these compressed sensing algorithms can solve it uh, if you have sufficient sparsity. Um, so this multiplexing effect is just totally inherent to lensless cameras because a point has to map to lots of pixels because you don't have a lens to, to form an image with it. Um, so it's kind of like opportunistically taking advantage of what already exists. Um, when we're trying to do 3D, it's a little bit different. We're not throwing away pixels that we measured because that's wasteful. We're instead taking all the pixels, this 2D set of pixels and using it to reconstruct a third dimension. So it's a little bit different. Um, you can read our paper if you want a more mathematical justification why compressed sensing works for 3D. Um, but here's the result. So we get this as our reconstruct, our, our raw data is just one, one 2D measurement that looks like this. And then the 3D reconstruction of this little leaf looks like this, and you're just seeing the 3D reconstruction spin. So you can get a sense that it has good depth information. And this good depth information really only works when you're fairly close to the sensor. OK, so I'm really excited about this for microscopy because uh, it sort of gets at a fundamentally really important uh, capability. So if you think of it, I, I wrote space bandwidth product here on this axis, but basically space bandwidth product is the number of voxels one can resolve in the image. And uh, usually you trade off space bandwidth product with speed. So if you have a point scanning microscope, you measure one point at a time. So I can measure high resolution across a very big volume if I am willing to take a lot of time. And for live samples, I'm not willing to take a lot of time. So light sheet has been really popular because it has a pretty good trade off between scan time versus 
space bandwidth product. You can get very high resolution, big volume images in fairly reasonable time that cells don't move too much. But anything that moves more than like lazy cells do, uh, you need faster speed capture. So light field microscopy is a great way to do single shot 3D capturing, but you drastically sacrifice your resolution, which is the whole point of using a microscope in the first place. And so uh, it has some limited capabilities just because of that resolution loss. Whereas this diffuser can, um, any sparsity that you have can be exploited via this compressed sensing approach, such that you have a chance if your object is really sparse in some basis set to be able to do uh, like lots of voxels with single shot. And this is particularly valuable, I think, for like things like an fast animals swimming around in a, in a 3D volume where they're not gonna occupy a lot of the volume at any given time, but they're moving all over the place within this big volume. So we've got a lot of collaborators interested in this. And I'm just generally excited about this because uh, now our speed doesn't scale with the number of voxels in the image, but rather with the sparsity of the sample, which depends on your application. One of the big applications we've been pursuing is neural activity tracking in mice. So the idea is that if we can build these uh, lensless imagers, they're really compact and lightweight. That's actually super valuable for head mounting on a mouse because then the mouse can run around and it's not affecting its behavior too much. Um, you could also tile them together. We haven't done that, uh, but I'll show you uh, what we have done so far. Um, so this is a different setup. It's on a bigger microscope, but this is the idea is that with this kind of technique, we can uh, take single shot 2D measurements and reconstruct 3D. And then we can do that over time at time scales of the frame rate of the camera. And the frame rate of the camera is fast enough to, to track neural dynamics that happens on millisecond time scales. So this map here is a 3D map of all of the neurons that we detected in this zebrafish's brain. You can see the two side lobes of the brain. And then the colors over time represent the activity or, or our measured activity of each of those neurons. Um, and we did build a flat scope version of this. So a extremely flat uh, lensless version of this. Here's that looking at a zebrafish and you're looking at neural activity again, you can see individual neurons fire at different times. So we designed the whole thing to have uh, a big field of view, but keeping at least single neuron resolution. Um, and then we, our time resolution just needs to be faster than neural activity. So, you know, a 60 frame per second camera can do that. Um, the other variant that we've built that's actually been really, I, I think probably the most useful so far is this mini scope version. So the Miniscope is a really popular open source 3D printed microscope that you can build. And a lot of neuroscience labs use it um, for, for mouse imaging because you can head mount this on a mouse and it's, it's lightweight enough that it can run around. So this thing is smaller than a quarter, right? Uh, so our version of this is basically, uh, it's just a tiny microscope. And tiny microscopes have really interesting challenges. In particular, they use these grin lenses as their objectives and grin lenses are terrible objectives. They have horrible aberrations, um, but we don't care because we're gonna computationally undo all of that. And so we put our phase mask in here. Um, we actually designed a custom phase mask for this situation. I'll talk a little more about it later, but it looks like this. We fabricated this thing at Stanford at the NanoScribe there. Um, and then you've got a beam slider, so you can have the, this fluorescence imaging. So you've got one color coming in for illumination, and then you've got some color filters. You detect the, the other color for whatever your emission color is. So here's just some results. We designed this thing to have a few microns resolution so we can get single neuron resolution. Um, and then here's some results. This is the, the video that we captured, so the raw data, um, and then the reconstructed image. So we reconstruct 3D for every time point. This is a little water bear from our collaborators at UCSF. Um, it's like a little caterpillar. You can see its legs as it's crawling around. Um, okay, so this is the, this could be the end of the talk. I just say like everything works great, but I really wanna get into some of the nitty gritty details of what the challenges we've had to overcome here or the problems with these systems. Um, and this is one of my favorite quotes that I stole from Mike Geim at Duke. Uh, and it's pretty common to computational imaging, I would say, that we are working so hard to design these imaging systems that are extremely efficient, where every measurement we take matters a lot. Then we end up with really fragile systems where every error we have causes lots of problems and you can get really bad errors, really bad artifacts from relatively small errors. 
And some of this is just a trade-off you have to make, particularly with compressed sensing. You, you maybe just have to choose between um, a really like redundant, efficient, uh, redundant system and a really efficient measurement system. Um, so we wanna quantify that a little bit. Um, and if you think about this, um, along these sort of axes of things we care about here that we want a big field of view, we want high resolution, that's basically our space bandwidth product. Um, and we also want good speed. We are saying that we're achieving all of these. We haven't traded one off for the other. And I think that's the beauty of this kind of approach. But what is the price that we pay? And I think this was a, sort of the, one of the original questions. Um, and the price you pay is signal to noise ratio. So uh, if you think about taking a point and mapping it to a point, that is good for signal to noise ratio. You pile all the light onto one point. Then when you add Poisson noise, it's sort of like your best case scenario. Now we're taking a point and we're mapping it to this caustic pattern, which spreads across a lot of pixels. So we need, to, we need this multiplexing effect of spreading across a lot of pixels in order to do compressed sensing. So our system like doesn't work without it, but we are spreading the light over more pixels. And then when I add Poisson noise, it hurts me more. And so if you, we wanted to like sort of try to quantify, quantify how much does it hurt. It's kind of hard because it depends a lot on the geometry and the particular situation. So we did it for this particular case of our 3D mini scope as compared to the 2D mini scope, because this is something that a, a neuroscientist might really care about, that um, they've got this 2D mini scope and we're providing them with a way to make a simple hack to it that puts this phase mask in. Actually, we remove the tube lens of that 2D mini scope and we move the, the sensor closer. So we make the whole thing lighter weight and smaller, um, and we give you 3D capabilities. So this seems like a big win, but what you lose is some signal to noise ratio performance. And so we did just this like sort of apples to apples simulation of, of how bad you lose, you lose uh, in terms of signal to noise. So you can see like with a lot of noise, um, our reconstructions are definitely worse, but you're getting 3D for free out of this. So this is just showing one one slice of the 3D, whereas the 2D mini scope can't do 3D, and you're getting a, a microscope that's lighter weight and smaller. So up to people to decide whether they're willing to make that trade-off. Um, of course, with compressed sensing, it has this nonlinear regularizer. It's very hard to characterize things, uh, like characterize your imaging system explicitly because it's nonlinear. Um, so sparsity matters, and how much sparsity is enough. This is sort of, I think this is a kind of a throwaway slide because uh, this is just giving you a sense of one particular situation as I increase the sparsity, how does, the, how does your error change? But uh, it depends a lot on your geometry. So I feel like this isn't a super informative. Okay, so here's another dirty secret. Um, our system is not telecentric. Um, so that means like it's like a regular camera where your field of view is expanding as you go far away from it. So um, these white lines here represent like the resolvable voxels in the system. Um, and so uh, when you're really close to the sensor, you have close to isotropic good resolution. And as you go further away, um, the lateral resolution gets worse just because everything's spreading out. This is very similar to regular camera and photography. Um, so your field of view gets bigger, but the resolution gets worse. Um, and then the Z resolution drops off dioptrically. So when I said the hyperfocal distance was two meters, so it was basically like past this distance, like for photography, um, you're out here where there's really no depth discrimination. And then this little leaf I showed you was a lot closer to the sensor. So we do all the 3D imaging closer to the sensor and we actually reconstruct on a non-uniform or non-Euclidean 3D grid, which makes everything a little more complicated. Um, okay, so this is one of the most interesting challenges for these systems. And this is totally common to all of these mass-based lensless imaging systems. Um, so here we go, we have a two point resolution. So typically if I make a, a microscope and you want to know its resolution, I'm gonna tell you it's two point resolution. How close can I move two points together and still resolve them? So um, nonlinear system, because we have this nonlinear regularizer means that we have to do this on a like sort of like on a case by case basis. So if I figure, if I just take two points and move them closer together and then sort of plot the cross section uh, 
this is the closest I can put them and still resolve them according to like sort of like a, a Raleigh-ish criteria. So whatever the, and this resolution is changing with depth as I pointed out because it's non-telecentric. So whatever this resolution is, is just at one particular depth. Okay, so here's the interesting part is that um, notice this is X and Z. So when I make a grid of four by four points at the two point resolution, I should be able to resolve this four by four grid of points, but I can't. And it's because this situation is less sparse. And this is kind of like worst case for, for sparsity is that all of your non-zero elements are clumped together. So we're gonna look at the worst case scenario because that's, uh, we're just trying to characterize that. So like how far apart do I have to put those points to be able to resolve them in the 16 point case? Well, it turns out I had to move them apart about 1.6 times the two point resolution. So if you had trusted me that my resolution was this two point resolution that I gave you, you would be in trouble when you put anything in that wasn't that was more than two points. Um, so this two point resolution is the best case scenario. And this makes it really complicated when people want to know the resolution of my system because then I'm like, what object are you looking at? How sparse is your object? Um, so we wanted to come up with a metric to talk about like how to get to this 1.6. And I chose this four by four grid because if you do a five by five grid, six by six grid, it doesn't get much worse. So the whole like all, all of the, the problems sort of saturate and it doesn't get much worse than this. So this, this 1.6 X of the two point resolution is pretty sufficient for almost arbitrary amount of sparsity. Okay, so we didn't have a good idea for how to do this. So this is what we did. We said that we're gonna, we wanna talk about condition numbers because that's how you talk about how I'll pose the problem is, but condition numbers only work for linear systems. And so what we did was we just said like, okay, let's assume that we knew um, which elements of the scene were not sparse. And then we're just gonna like take uh, basically a sub matrix, make a sub matrix problem uh, to solve for those. So it's like, if I knew where there were non-sparse elements, how ill-conditioned is the problem of solving for those non-sparse elements? Um, so we're, we're calling this like this, like the, the condition of this of the sub problem. So now we can talk about condition numbers and this is a pretty good proxy. So we've matched this up to real world experiments and this is a pretty good proxy. It's not perfect, of course. Okay, so what we have here is like how far apart the, the two points are, or if it's 50 points, then they're, there's, then they're in some grid of, uh, so how far apart are each of them spaced? So as I get further apart, everything should get easier. The condition number should get better. Um, and then as I make more and more point sources in my grid, then the, the whole system gets worse, right? And so what you're supposed to point out here is that here, this is two points, 50 points, um, and then I'm going all the way up to 250 points. And there's not much difference between like even 150 and 250. So that's what I mean by like all the problems kind of saturate. And so you can get a fairly good idea of the worst case scenario. So at least you have kind of a bound on how well this thing will perform in different situations. If anyone has better ideas for how to, how to like describe resolution given this weirdness, I would love to hear them because I think this kind of thing is really hard to convey to a biologist who's thinking about using the technique. Um, okay, so another interesting challenge that we fought is model mismatch. So I said our system is shift invariant. In practice, it is not perfectly shift invariant. And uh, shift invariance implies paraxial approximation, which becomes less true at higher angles. So the diffuser cam I showed you had about, this was about its, uh, its angular field of view. And if you go to those outer, outer higher angle um, edges of the image, then our, our, our shift invariant assumption becomes not quite true. So the point spread functions out here at the edges of the image are not exactly shifted versions of, of the, the central point spread function. And that is gonna hurt our reconstruction for sure. So we could go and measure every single point spread function, right? Um, uh, and we could, and then we could do as well as this red line, but it would be a huge undertaking to do that kind of massive calibration. So we kind of just said, we're, we're gonna accept this little bit of extra um, error or like worse performance due to it. So it, how, it, how it manifests is basically you get slightly worse resolution at the edges of the image. And you could just design your system to have 
higher resolution across a smaller field of view and just completely avoid this problem. So to do that, you would use a diffuser that has very smooth bumps and you would place it a little further from the sensor and that would give you this like narrow field of view uh, situation if that's what you want. But if you wanna do microscopy, we need to pull all of the, the samples close, to, very close to the sensor, meaning that we're coming in at very high angles, much larger than 37 degrees. And so, um, so Grace built the, the flat, flat microscope version that I showed you earlier with the zebrafish. And she had massive problems with this because if she just assumes it's shift invariant, which it is not, then she gets terrible reconstructions. These are like fluorescent beads flowing through a, a microfluidic chamber. Um, so she worked on uh, algorithms for, for dealing with the shift, shift variants. So basically she just measured the point spread function at a very coarse grid of spots. And you can actually calculate the Nyquist sampling for the, the grid for how many point spread functions you need to calibrate. And then, um, and then actually the best, she tried a whole bunch of like low rank and, and uh, decomposition approaches, but the best approach was just to interpolate those point spread functions in between um, the ones that were measured at different points within the field. Uh, this is just the same result, but for our 3D mini scope, which had this problem as well. Uh, and, and in the 3D mini scope, the problem was primarily due to that terrible grin lens. It has horrible shift varying aberrations because uh, miniature lenses are just not possible to be very highly aberration corrected. Okay, so uh, another big secret is that a lot of the results I showed you don't actually use these like off the shelf diffusers like I did in the beginning. So we started out this project trying to do opportunistic imaging, um, just using what we had on the shelf diffusers. Um, as I mentioned, the lens is much better SNR wise because it piles all the light into one point. And so the problem with these smooth diffusers is they have positive bumps, which are focusing light and negative bumps, which are spraying light out. And the negative bumps spray light out and that causes like extra background, which is totally useless for reconstruction. Um, so where we went with this is that, oh, so this point was that the lens does better SNR wise, but it's useless at 3D because then it spreads all the light out as you go off focus. Um, so you could do micro lenses, right? So it's like a diffuser. It has like small bumps, but uh, now you pile the light into sharp spots. So this is sort of like black in, in the middle is good. This has like high contrast point spread function, but this is no good because if you shift your point spread function, the point spread, so if you shift your point in the scene, the point spread function shifts. And at some point it shifts by exactly one period. So the periodic nature of it makes it really ambiguous. Like which point source was this? Uh, is, this, is, this becomes pretty ill posed because they have very similar point spread functions. So really what you want and what we've come to using are these randomly spaced micro lenses um, because you can shift these arbitrarily and they'll still have nice unique response um, and they're piling the light into sharp spots. And we think very carefully about how many of these to put. And then we also design their focal lengths so that different, different micro lenses come into focus at different depths because that means you get like a sharp point at every possible depth so that you can do uh, like a deconvolution on the high spatial frequencies at all the different depths. Okay, so this was all sort of heuristic telling you how we thought about going to new designs for diffusers, but really the goal is to, perf to just optimize, like sort of like learn the best possible phase mask to put into the system in order to get the best result. And uh, this is the job of end-to-end -end learning or end-to-end -end system design. So a lot of previous work was around trying to optimize the inverse problem algorithm. So putting in priors um, and trying to like, sort of like figure out the best priors or optimizer or the best algorithm to optimize the, the, the inverse problem. Whereas, uh, sorry, more recently, this end-to-end -end stuff is about trying to optimize the measurements taken. And these are all super recent papers because this is sort of recently become more feasible uh, thanks to computation issues. And so now we can just learn the best diffuser using this. So this is extremely computational. We need to like, uh, we need to run these. Uh, we do this with the unrolled neural networks and, and they get like extremely memory. Um, they use a lot of memory. And so we have some tricks to get around that, which I'm not gonna talk about. Um, but here's one of the designs. So this is, this is like, as we're optimizing the design of one of these random micro lens diffusers. And this is, you can see it evolve into its optimal design. 
And since everything is nonlinear, it's optimal for whatever sample we put in. So we put in a representative sample that's supposed to represent like our, our neurons say in 3D. And you can, you can do designs for each individual situation that you might care about, which we're working on now. Okay, uh, I'm gonna be out of time. So I'll just really quickly go through a couple of uh, side projects that emanated from this. And uh, this one is really neat. So basically I've told you that we can take a 2D measurement and use it to reconstruct a 3D scene. But then we started thinking about how can we reconstruct three dimensions that aren't all spatial dimensions. So instead of X, Y, Z, how about X, Y, time? Um, and this was my student Nick's idea who's, who just started a faculty position at UCSD. Um, he said that because of the rolling shutter, we get some temporal information for free. Um, so this is also opportunistic imaging. So if you think about uh, as the rolling shutter moves down, you have, if you have a rolling shutter sensor, as it moves down the image, then different points in the scene might light up during the time that this rolling shutter is moving down. And you'll only capture them if they happen to line up with the rolling shutter. If you do this with diffuser cam, then the rolling shutter basically captures every event at every time point because every point in the scene maps to every every row on the sensor. So every row on the sensor contains information from the entire scene. So if your scene is extremely sparse, you could conceptually reconstruct the entire scene from a single row on the sensor. This is compressed sensing where we've like, I showed you before I could delete random sets of pixels in the image. What if I delete everything except one row? It's not a great, what, it's not a great choice of things to delete, but it's what we have opportunistically. And so, uh, you can do that. So if you set this all up as a, a three-dimensional space-time problem, you can actually solve this and you get this kind of result. So you capture a single frame of some moving dynamic scene. And if I just reconstructed it as a 2D image, I would just get a blurred image, just like a regular camera. However, because I know that it came from a rolling shutter camera, I can do this space-time reconstruction. So this, is all re this video is entirely reconstructed from this single captured image frame from a rolling shutter. Um, and we're reconstructing here. Well, I said it's 4,500 frames per second, but it, it's, it's about 100 frames that we're reconstructing here from one image. And so the scene has to be very sparse in order to be able to do this, similar to the 3D case. Here's just another example. Important scientific application of Nerf darts hitting apples sitting on textbooks. Um, and I was just like, really, this just is like a neat idea and a nice extension of our stuff. Um, so it got us thinking about what other three-dimensional things can we measure um, now that we've got like this compressed sensing working. So now we can do hyperspectral, so X, Y, lambda. So instead of the third dimension or time, our third dimension is now color. Um, and Christina in my group came up with this and she started working with this company called Biavi who makes these spectral filter arrays for hyperspectral imaging. So what they have is basically, uh, they have these like, I call them super pixels where it, within each super pixel, there's a grid of eight by eight spectral color filters. And so you're supposed to think, you're supposed to be like, like basically measuring 64 colors at every super pixel. So your lateral resolution would be the size of the super pixel. And then your, your uh, spectral resolution is just the 64 color channels that you've put into those color filters. So Christina's idea was that um, instead of using a regular lens with this, we can put a diffuser, a diffuser in front of it. So it becomes, uh, thinner and lighter weight again, maybe you care about that, maybe not, but then you get this multiplexing approach where all the points map to a lot of the different super, super pixels on the sensor, and then you can do compressed sensing and she can actually solve for sub super pixel lateral resolution with all four 64 color channels by solving exactly the same problem as the 3D or the, the time space problem. Um, so that's the end of my talk. And uh, I think like, I like to like go back to the big picture thinking about computers and optics should talk more. But one of the big themes in my lab that I think this project represents very nicely is trying to make new imaging systems that can do new things without fancy hardware or new physics um, and trying to make it very accessible or reproducible um, so that other people can do this themselves in their own labs. And we'd be very happy to help anyone who wants to uh, attempt any of these in their own labs because we've tried very hard to make all of our stuff um, very reproducible. That doesn't just mean posting our code online, but also using cheap and, and easy to access 
um, devices and uh, leaving instructions in our open source website so you can try to do it yourself. So I'll thank my group who did all this work and happy to take questions. Is it okay? Is it okay to go now? Sure. Um, I don't, I don't. I hope my questions don't come across as hostile. It's just that I still don't understand whether I don't see how this could benefit my particular problem, uh, and therefore I'm I'm hoping that you can convince me. So I, I hope you don't interpret. I that. didn't say I'm it can. It. I didn't say it can solve every problem. Every image. Right, right, right. <laughs> but, uh, okay, so I'm I'm like Austin, like your neighbor Austin. Rhoda, I'm in the business of trying to build this instrument to take the sharpest possible images of the living retina. And I have a lot of colleagues in my department that use microscopes all day long. And many of them, I would argue that maybe the vast majority of them never even press the deconvolution button in their software from microscopes. And, and my worst nightmare by doing anything computational that might introduce artifacts is that my clinical colleagues will interpret or misinterpret an artifact that comes out of the, for example, from the convolution that you get all these little bumps here and there, and they might interpret them as a real feature when it's actually an artifact of the processing. So that is a really big concern to me. So, and also I was, even though the results, don't get me wrong, given the images that you start with, it's absolutely shocking how good the output is. So I'm super impressed about that. But yet, they don't look as good as the ground truth, which I think is closer to what a regular microscope or glass would produce. And also because I'm in the business of trying to get help my colleagues that are pursuing a scientific question and don't want to learn anything about optics. Uh, and they don't want to, because, not because, it's not a criticism, it's that they have a lot of other things they need to learn about, about the biology and the chemistry and so on. I feel that I'm, I'm giving them more knobs to operate and I'm making it more difficult for them to look at the final product when they looked at a, something made with, with glass. And if, I, if you could go back one slide, you're replacing the glass, which I guess maybe I am, a, I guess I like glass more than I like silicon, but you are effectively um, making the problem, um, you're putting other hardware, that is the, the GPUs on the other end. So sure, it might be compact at the end of the light capture, but then setup is more complex. So I'm, I'm still confused, other than for when you need a very light, um, light collecting device, and you have sparsity, sufficient sparsity in your object. So is, is that, do I understand that is the correct domain to apply the computational techniques? So there's a lot to say on all of those comments. Okay, okay, um, I'll start up now. So Sorry. the artifacts I absolutely worry about. Um, if you know about like compressed sensing reconstructions are becoming commercial in MRI. And I'm surprised that it's not like, more dangerous to do it, but the reconstructions have become reliable over many, many years of being vetted and, and, and like working with doctors. And so that's the kind of thing that has to happen for these to become like in clinical practice, routine clinical practice. And I think like any computational imaging method that you do is going to have some artifacts uh, whenever the system's not perfect. So you can also, I could argue that like, you know, our systems are like a one-off system built by a grad student to, sh to show that this idea works. And whereas like, so do we really expect to compete with your iPhone camera that's had how many dozen engineers working full-time on it for how many decades, um, including all of the like sort of optical engineering design that came before them. So one thing I could say is that if you put that kind of effort and resource into these kinds of systems, you could probably make them as good quality as those other there's there's no there's no like fundamental reason why you couldn't make them as good quality as these other modalities um so it's a little bit unfair to compare the two um but in, my group as i mentioned has made a concerted 
strategy decision to not go after that, to not try to compete on quality basis, but instead to look for problems that simply cannot be done with a regular microscope. So we don't want to make you, your regular microscope have better images. People have been working on that problem for centuries and I don't want to compete with all those smart people um, unless we can do something that those, those microscopes cannot do. So the single shot 3D, for example, you cannot do that with a regular bright field. Like you can't do that with your regular microscope. Um, so there's scanning microscopes that can do that, but they're going to sacrifice speed. Um, so basically, we're looking for problems that um, we're looking to do things that you couldn't do otherwise. Or the 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 time space stuff with the rolling shutter. Um, you could maybe buy a camera. Could you buy a camera with the effective frame rate that we get maybe for like $100,000? So maybe there's that's going to say like, what are the application spaces? There are people who can't afford the one that could do it for $100,000 or take the $100,000 camera and do the same thing and get even higher space, temporal resolution that simply is not achievable with that, with even the most expensive camera. So I think like that's more of a like, we're not trying to say we should be used in every case. And then the other thing you mentioned was that we're replacing optics with computers. And I will disagree with that because we're solving problems that optics alone cannot do. And so I think that is uh, not totally fair to say that we're replacing optics with silicon. Um, and certainly you're gonna have to do more compute at the end, but the argument is that compute is cheap, um, uh, like sort of, and it's getting cheaper and it's getting faster and better. So, and it's easy to, to give someone else your, your code, not so easy to like give them hardware. Okay. I, I could argue some lenses are getting cheaper, but let's leave that aside. The other thing I don't understand is the 3D objects that you showed were very sparse. And there's something I never quite understand. And, and Gordon has presented some algorithms to, to do computational imaging in 3D as well. And I don't quite understand if what happens if you have stacks of objects at different depths, right? So that is, for example, where a confocal microscope is very helpful in that it can reject light from different layers. Can you apply the 3D imaging that you have if you have one object in front of the other or multiple objects in different layers? Do you know yeah, we saying? solve for things that are like, I guess maybe you don't believe there's one anything in front of another thing here. Depends on what orientation this was in. Um, but yes, we solve for the 3D reconstruction. And just like confocal, the light has to pass through both layers. And so there's, so the depth discrimination here, or the optical sectioning is computational, but it's there, there's real optical sectioning. Um, same with in here, right? This is like, there's things being reconstructed on both sides of the object. So it's not just the convex hull or the outside shape. So as long as you're getting light from the deeper objects, you, you can reconstruct it. Fair enough, thank you. Uh, I think there's uh, one more question in the chat. Do you want me to read it out loud or? Uh, sure, I don't have the chat open unless I stop sharing. I can, uh, uh, hi. Laura, this is Joyce. Oh, hi. Uh, very nice talk. Um, I was just wondering, in your last comments, you it seemed like you moved away from the diffuser cam, and we're talking about a sparse microlens array. And, and then I was trying to remember why you didn't like, originally, the light field microscopy, because it seemed like that's where you, know, you were going back to something that was like that. And I was wondering if you could kind of remind me what the trade-offs were, um, because it seemed like you were moving towards going back to getting depth with this. Yeah, that's a good question. Let me see. I just killed some slides at the very end. So actually the very first project that inspired this, this was actually a really cool project because it all started out with visit day for Nick Antipo was one of my first grad students. And on visit day, he's an optical engineer. And I was saying, can you make a light field camera with a diffuser instead of a micro lens array? And my reasoning was it's cheaper. You don't have to pixel align everything and make it perfect. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have to like design the, the, the micro lenses perfectly. Um, uh, so, and uh, the other big thing is that in a microscope, we're always changing our, our microscope objective, which changes the numerical aperture. And uh, with a light field microscope, you have to match the numerical aperture of your main lens to your 
micro lens array. And that's super annoying because you need a new micro lens array for every um, objective that you use. So you basically have to use a fixed lens, which is what Lytro did. Um, and so we were saying like, can you just like replace this with a diffuser and solve the, the computational inverse problem? So that was his first project. And basically every pixel in the sensor uh, in a light field camera maps to like some box of your, your light field space. So this is space and angle. Whereas with the diffuser, every pixel in your sensor maps to like some weird like swath of the, the X theta space. Mm -hmm. So, but you can figure that out. You can, you can like map it out and then you can solve for the light field. So here's some uh, from a single measurement with the diffuser there, you can reconstruct the light field. This is just a slice, epipolar slice. And then you can do this digital refocusing. Once you have the light field, you can do whatever you want with the light field. Um, Reason why I don't talk about this is because we decided it was kind of dumb to solve for 4D and then take that 4D thing and solve for 3D. So we wanted to look at fluorescence microscopy, which is 3D intensity is what matters. So like why go this, to this extra dimension? It was causing all kinds of computational and sampling problems um, and then go to 3D afterwards. So we just wrote out the model to go directly from 3D to this 2D measurement. And it ended up being a very different model, um, but but yeah, that was kind of the impetus. And then if I go back to my like, why don't we use an array of micro lenses? This is actually, we found out later that there's a group in Spain that did this uh, a little bit different ways. So they put the micro lens array and the sensor in Fourier space in the pupil plane of their microscope. They called it the Fourier light field microscope. And they had some really nice papers demonstrating that putting this stuff in Fourier space basically makes everything shift invariant and you get a bigger field of view, or sorry, you can get better resolution out of this than a regular light field microscope in the sense that a normal light field microscope has like great resolution at one particular depth plane. And as you change the depth plane, the resolution gets worse. So if you go to the depth plane where it matches with the micro lenses, then you have resolution only on, lateral resolution only on the size of the micro lenses, which is horrible. Um, so they showed that if you put everything in Fourier space, the micro lens array and the sensor, that you can get sort of pretty much isotropic resolution across different depths near the sample plane. So it's a little bit worse than the best case of the regular, um, of the regular light field microscope, but it's much better overall over depths. And I have this. So our diffuser, our diffuser microscope, when you put so our three D three D mini scope one is is a type where. We have an objective lens, but then we have the diffuser in Fourier space, and it has exactly that property. So let me find my plots. Um, yeah, I guess I don't have it in my slides, sorry. But that's exactly what we see is that we get better resolution, uh, that more uniform resolution. So we get good resolution or sufficient resolution across a much bigger volume when everything's in Fourier space. And then if you were to do it with the, so their Fourier diffuser scope is the same as ours, but it's with a uniform micro lens array. So they don't do any compressed sensing. And when you do that, you have this, this problem where when you shift by more than a period, you get this ambiguity. So what they did is they just said, you're not allowed to shift by more than one period. So they like severely restricted their field of view in order to be able to solve it. So mm -hmm. our field of view is like 10 times bigger than theirs. Mm -hmm. um, just because we randomly space these and put in the compressed sensing approach. Right. So, but now you're into this randomly spaced micro lens array and, mm -hmm. and that's the direction you're going as opposed to the diffuser cam. Yeah. So <laughs> we've debated a lot, but some of my students still call this a diffuser. It's just a designer diffuser. Um, so it's still, it still has some similar properties, but yeah, it's now designed. Uh, it depends. Like we still have, like you can go make your scotch tape cam. I think like, it's fun to do this opportunistic imaging, but for things like, like the neural activity tracking, people are putting a lot of investment and money into this thing. You want the best possible system you can have and you're willing to spend some money on it. Mm -hmm. um, so it basically like the problem with these designer diffusers is actually fabricating them. And I think Carilla spent like four or five months like messing with the nanoscribe. There's some people there who are extremely helpful um, with dealing with all of the problems with the nanoscribe because we're actually looking for a relatively large sag on our lenses. Um, these, these are actually pretty big. This is about six millimeters across for this particular example. So fabricating them uh, gets a little tricky because they're not diffractive elements. And so they can't be fabricated with just like uh, basic lithography. So 
dry scale of photography, but then these things get expensive and difficult to fabricate. So we've tried a lot of different ways of fabricating them. In fact, um, the, the flat microscope version, it requires a lot. So this is for the Fourier space. There's only about eight micro lenses that it ends up choosing, but the flat one needs a lot of micro lenses, like hundreds. And we actually ended up fabricating that by like building the system to, to like drop ball bearings onto a copper plate and they would create indents that would act like the, the micro lenses. And then we would use the copper plate as a, as a mold to create our face masks. Mm. And that like worked okay, but it's very, it's just like super time consuming. So, so we're, we're not at the place. For this perfect way to just send someone a file and get back that face mask for less uh, than 20 yeah, dollars That was my other question. I was wondering as you were talking, <laughs> if you could use your methods to optimize the design of some arbitrary, you know, uh, lens array um, where you could 3D print it or something because, you know, because now things are out of plastic. I don't know if that's, if that's possible, if the resolution of these yeah, they're yeah. like, I think we need better, we need better resolution than the 3D printers can create yeah. for the particular yeah. problems we've chosen. Right. right. We actually right. thought about that. Like, could we just switch to different problems that could use bigger? Yeah. Numbers? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, one thing that's good is that if the fabrication isn't perfect, then that gets calibrated out. So you take these point spread function measurements to calibrate. And so it won't create artifacts. All it will create is a slightly less than ideal system. Right. Right. Thanks. Uh, but we're trying to like we want to write a paper on like we designed this diffuser and here it does this performance and here the experimental performance matches what we predicted. But if the fabrication doesn't match, then the performance won't match. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a little bit like annoying. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, nice talk. Thank you. Thanks. So uh, yeah, perhaps we can thank the speaker one more time and take any more questions offline.